Have you been told that your eggs are too old or that you need to start considering using donor egg? Or maybe some of those other terrible things that you've been told because you're trying to get pregnant and you're over 40? I'm here to tell you that they might not be true and there might actually be something that you can do about it. I wanna help you change your fertility and improve your chances of conception now so that you can get pregnant even if you're over 40. Keep watching so that you can learn how. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Sklar, the fertility expert, and I work with couples from all over the world to make sure that they can get pregnant naturally. If you're trying to get pregnant, subscribe and hit the bell so that I can help you too. So having children over 40 can be challenging, especially when most of the time, if you walk into your OBGYN's office, they're gonna say, well, you're older, my suggestion is that you go automatically and speak to a IVF clinic or a reproductive endocrinologist, depending on how they refer to it. And when you walk into that clinic, as soon as they see that you're over 40, regardless of what your hormones look like or your reproductive history, typically what they're gonna bring up at some point, if not at the beginning of the conversation, is that you need to use or consider using donor eggs. But is donor egg necessary if you're over 40? I mean, they make you feel like it is, but is it really necessary? So one of the reasons that donor egg gets brought up when you walk into an IVF clinic is twofold. One is their success rates, and two, they truly believe that donor egg is going to be more successful for you, which obviously that's true, right? Because if, if you're over 40 and you're going to be given an egg of a woman who's in her 20s, let's say, obviously that egg is going to be of better quality because it's younger than an egg of a woman who's over 40. So it's not that what they're saying is wrong or inaccurate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right choice for you or even that it needs to be brought up in a conversation so quickly and so early in the fertility process for you. And obviously I don't know where any of you are in your fertility journey. We all potentially enter these stages at different, at different times. But those are the main two reasons why we're potentially going to be offered or you're potentially gonna be offered a suggestion to use a donor egg. Now coming back to point one, because I kind of said it and then jumped off into point two, is that statistics, IVF statistics. Statistics are important for an IVF clinic. It's how they can sell their services to the public. We have a, an X percent success rate with our patients who are this age or that population or so forth, right? So if they could say that for women over 40, we have a higher success rate, then that's, that's a good selling point. And if that higher success rate is because of donor eggs, then so be it for them, right? But in my mind, that should not be the determining factor as to why you are recommended donor eggs. And not all IVF clinics are the same, so I don't want to make you feel that way. And I'm not trying to insult any of the IVF clinics. I'm just making a point that often that's the case. There are plenty of IVF clinics that don't consider that as part of their process when it comes to statistics because they're going to work with and accept any patient who comes through the door regardless of your medical history. But I am giving you those two reasons. Those are the two main reasons that I find that you're going to be referred to donor egg. And if you've tried many things and have had multiple attempts with IVF that have been unsuccessful, maybe a donor option is the right choice for you. But it's not for everybody and I don't want any of you to feel that way. I also want you to know that your fertility is in your control, it's in your hands. And I want you to understand there's a lot of things that you can do to influence positively and, and negatively for that matter, but we're talking about the positive changes we can make to influence our fertility, to make changes so that your fertility over 40 potentially is better than it was before. Okay, and I want you to be able to take those thoughts and those words that have been told to you about donor eggs, take them out of your head, let's toss them over to the side, and let's work on what you can do to support your body and create better eggs of better uterine environment so that you can get pregnant over 40. The most important aspect of fertility over 40 or after 40 is egg quality. And now egg quality is important regardless of how old you are, but for sure, the older we get, then egg quality becomes more important and the way we manage our egg quality, what we need to do to support that becomes more essential. So when you think of egg quality, I want you to think of mitochondrial function. And this is the powerhouse of the cell and naturally begins to degrade as we age. 
regardless of fertility or not. As we age, mitochondrial function, cellular health degrades, and that's why there is a piece of medicine called anti-aging medicine or regenerative medicine or rejuvenation medicine, right? Anything along those lines. This is what I call reproductive anti-aging. And so improving egg quality is just the beginning when trying to get pregnant over 40, but there's definitely a lot more. And if you really want to dive deeper and are serious about getting pregnant this coming year, then I have a free training for all of you moms-to-be, and I'm calling this Fertility Anti-Aging. It's my bulletproof method to be super fertile over 35. So for all of you over 40, this you fall into this category and you count in there as well. And the truth is that as we age, time does compress on us and does become a factor. So if you're serious about getting pregnant right now, which I'm sure all of you are because you're watching this video, then you need to take uh, action now and take advantage of this free training. The link for that free training is below. So uh, go ahead and click on that link below so that you can get access to that free training. And on top of that, that will give you, if you want to, access to an application to work with me and my team so that we can potentially customize a fertility plan for you. So you have that link down below if you want it. So what can you do to restore mitochondrial function? It's a complicated word, so mitochondrial function, and thus improve egg quality. The first thing that you need to do before I take a sip of water is that you need to recognize that this takes time and it can take anywhere from 90 to 180 days depending on your health, your situation, uh, your lifestyle and all sorts of variables. So time is a piece of this process that you need to give yourself which is somewhat contradictory to the fact that when we're getting older, older time compresses and it starts to run out on us but we still have to take some time to address the underlying issues to rejuvenate a reproductive function so it goes both ways for you but i don't want you to look at this as time is running out i really want you to look at this as more of an opportunity an opportunity for you to make change and to see the results that you're looking for in your fertility okay so we can always do the half uh, the glass half empty or half full i'm always one for half full so don't look at this as a time crunch situation look at this as this time that i'm going to invest in myself as an opportunity to make the necessary changes in my overall health and my reproductive function so that i can have better quality eggs so the first place to start is testing because if you don't have the right information and you don't know what needs to be addressed then we don't know how to move forward or you don't know how to even make a plan for yourself. So this goes into the uh, saying that I like to say, which is test, don't guess. And that's why we say is because we don't wanna guess about what we need to do about ourselves. We wanna test and then create a plan around that. And testing is really important when we start talking about any fertility situation. But again, as we get older, that's even more important. So here are my recommended labs that I wanna make sure all of you run. And obviously this list is a more general list. It can get more complicated and complex depending on your history and your previous labs that you've had done. And by history, I mean is if you have certain conditions and family history that is affecting your health or you know potentially can affect your health. Now, those are all reasons why we might suggest other labs in addition to what I'm gonna recommend for you. But first and foremost, we wanna make sure that you have an updated hormone panel. And by updated, I mean, in the last six months. If you haven't done these labs, and I can't tell you how many people I talk to that haven't had these labs done, then that is definitely something that we need to uh, get moving on. So hormone panel that's done on day two, three, or four of your cycle, not all of those days, just one of those three days, and you're gonna do FSH, LH, and estradiol. And then these other ones don't necessarily need to be done on those days, but you're already going in on those days, so you might as well just put them all together and just save yourself a trip and just go once. So what are these tests and why are they important? Follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, tells us, well, first it's the hormone that your uh, pituitary produces to stimulate your ovaries to create more follicles and allow them to grow and mature over the course of your cycle. LH, luteinizing hormone, is the hormone that rises as you ovulate and estradiol is one of the three primary estrogens that your body creates and is an essential hormone for uh, reproductive health and function in all female health. And so why do we do these all in this time? Well, FSH is gonna help us understand what's going on with egg quality. And there is a relationship between all three of these numbers, but there's a feedback loop. So we wanna see that 
FSH and LH are uh, coincide and work together and that they're roughly a one-to-one -one ratio. And then estrogen keeps your FSH in check. So we wanna make sure that your estrogen is at a good level. And so we'd like for that to be somewhere between 30 and 80. If it's too low or too high, regardless of what your FSH is, then we start to question egg quality. We also start to question the accuracy of your FSH levels. So we wanna make sure we get those tested. In addition, we wanna make sure we get progesterone tested. And I test progesterone twice in a cycle, I test it on day two, three, or four, just to make sure it's low. I also test it seven days post ovulation to make sure that you have and are producing sufficient amounts of progesterone to hold a pregnancy. Then we wanna also test testosterone, both free and total, so we can see how your androgens are doing. And while we're on the androgen conversation, we also test your DHEA, which is a precursor hormone to your androgens. It's also an adrenal hormone, and it is a hormone that does influence egg quality. So those are, it has multiple meanings or purposes, I should say. On top of that, we always want to check thyroid function, so TSH, and if you're able to, a full thyroid panel, which would be my preference, and then AMH, anti-malarian hormone, which tells us how many eggs you have in reserve. It's not an end-all, be-all, but again, and none of these numbers are, it doesn't mean that we have to worry if our numbers aren't perfect, it just means that that's information for us to gather to create a good plan so we can change these numbers, and so we do want to test AMH. Um, I always test vitamin D, and again, there's a whole slew of other hormones that we can test as well. If you're not able to order these labs through your OBGYN or you want to take control of your fertility process and not have to worry about if your OBGYN or insurance company are going to approve them, then down below in the comment section you can find a link so that you can order your own tests on your own, which is a great resource for yourself. You can do it whenever you want. And on top of that, if you want to take advantage, and I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to take advantage of this discount, the company has allowed me to offer all of you a 20% discount to order those labs through them. Not to mention that they're already cheaper than if you would just walk into the lab on your own, but then they also are giving you a 20% discount. And so for that, the code is, although you'll see it also down below, is Dr. Mark 20, D-R-M-A-R-C 20, but it's below, so just check that out there. And so those are, that's a great resource for you to use whenever you want. Share it with your friends if you want to. They can always use it. So some other things that I often find are not done, and I just spoke to a woman the other day who's 47, who hasn't done some of these lab tests, and some of the things I'm about to mention, an HSG to have your fallopian tubes checked. It's so valuable to know if your fallopian tubes are open for various reasons. Is there an infection? Can you try naturally? Does it make sense for you to conceive naturally? So it does influence that process. So make sure you get an HSG done. That is definitely something you wanna discuss with your OB so that they can order it because that can be pricey. Always think it's really important to have an ultrasound done of your uterus and your pelvic area, pelvic region, so ovaries, uterus, tubes, and so forth, just to see if they see anything. So that's always valuable and should be done in most evaluations. And then obviously, again, that same woman who I was just talking about is 47, her uh, partner hasn't had a semen analysis done. And so having a semen analysis done, an up-to-date, accurate semen analysis done by a fertility clinic is also super valuable because you wanna know what you're dealing with Again, more information allows you to have a more accurate plan to make changes. So those are the labs that I like to recommend. And just remember, again, if you want to order those labs on your own, the blood test that I mentioned, the hormones, then you could just click on the link below to go ahead and take care of that on your own. The link below meaning in the description. So other things that are really important is digestive function. Now, often I have patients who say, Why is my well, yes, they are two totally sy different systems, but the hip bone's connected to the leg bone, and our body is connected, each system in our body is connected to each other, and so we can't isolate one part of our body or one system in this case from the other. We can't put on our blinders because you're seeing a specialist and ignore these other areas. And again, I was speaking to a woman this past week, a couple of days ago, she's I think 30, 
35 or 34 and she has seen so many different specialists but each one has been focusing on a different area she has rheumatoid arthritis so she's seeing the rheumatologist and then she has a lot of viral issues and immune issues so she's seeing a naturopath for that and then she's got her fertility issues and she's seeing somebody else for that but no one's talking to each other and no one's looking at all of those things so it goes hand in hand and your digestive function is no different it influences your overall hormones so it's not uncommon if we have a uh, bad digestive system that the gut bacteria is going to be off so the gut biome is not going to be uh, supported properly and in proper balance and that can cause an imbalance in hormones it can cause low progesterone or estrogen dominance or all sorts of other issues and on top of that that if we have severe digestive issues then why does our body want to reproduce it doesn't it wants to heal our digestive issues so it's really important that all of our systems are functioning properly and making sure that we have proper hormone balance which definitely can be influenced and affected by your digestive system if you have questions about how to reduce estrogen and uh, the whole estrogen dominant situation then I've got a link for you to a video that I have done on on this specific topic and you can check that out right over here you can click on that after this video so that you can check out that video on estrogen dominance if you've got more questions about that so my next point is about adrenal fatigue or adrenal function I actually don't like to use the word adrenal fatigue more adrenal dysfunction and our adrenal glands are an important gland that help to regulate our stress response they also communicate with your hypothalamus and pituitary which are the primary glands in your brain that produce FSH and LH and TSH and they talk to the rest of the body about regulating your endocrine system so if we're under a lot of stress that stress can impact our fertility and if we can't manage our stress appropriately even if that stress is not current even if it was in the past it can still affect your fertility and your endocrine system so that does need to be managed and accounted for in a reasonable way and if you remember before I mentioned DHEA as one of its functions is that it helps to support your adrenal glands um, so that's an important piece to what we're trying to address here as well so adrenal function and managing your nervous system and stress response is essential to overall health and fertility is no different so reproductive anti-aging as I mentioned much earlier definitely has to be considered as part of this process when we're when we are regulating and supporting our adrenal function so if all these tips haven't been enough for you I've got plenty more so keep watching here so sleep sleep is one of the biggest things that I talk to patients about and is one of the biggest things that I think is a factor in patients regulating their their hormones so what are the most important pieces about sleep and why first and foremost it's essential that we get good quality sleep and that we go to bed at a decent hour getting eight hours of sleep but going to bed at one in the morning and getting eight hours of sleep is very different than going to bed at 9 or 10 p.m. and getting eight hours of sleep our body has a certain rhythm a certain natural circadian rhythm that's really important for it to keep and going to bed earlier rather than later is part of that process to get good quality sleep I don't know if any of you have ever recognized this but check it out see if you feel different going to sleep at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. getting eight hours or going to sleep at 1 p.m. And getting eight hours of sleep it's not the same I notice it if I go to sleep late I'm sure all of you notice it but how about you comment below and let me know if you notice a difference in your sleeping patterns if you go to and, and your quality of sleep if you go to sleep earlier versus later so sleep is one of the most important things when we're talking about anti-aging or reproductive anti-aging because that's when your uh, body allows your cells to rejuvenate and rest and recharge so this is absolutely no different and what is a key uh, chemical to allow to helping us go to sleep is melatonin well melatonin levels start to begin as the Sun goes down and around let's just say 6 or 8 p.m. depending on the time of year and continues to rise over the course of the evening but these levels of melatonin as they rise help us to go to sleep and if we prolong our bedtime then we miss out on that peak or that rise of melatonin that helps us to settle down and if we go to sleep too late that melatonin levels are already decreasing so it makes it harder to go to sleep and harder to stay asleep and get a good quality sleep not to mention that there have been some studies that show that melatonin can support egg quality as well so it has multiple effects it helps you get to sleep it also also can support your egg quality so 
Food. Food is an important piece that I often, often discuss. Having、uh, good quality food, getting enough、uh, good quality food, and avoiding high amounts of sugar and processed sugar, alcohol. These are all factors that we want to be careful of, avoid, and manage properly when we're talking about food. Now, I have plenty of videos on food and good nutrition and what to eat and not to eat, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that right now. But if you want more information, On diet and nutrition, then just click right here to get that information, and、um, you can check that out afterwards. Okay, one of the areas that I don't talk about a lot, but I think is really, in,、uh, really valuable as we are discussing how to improve our egg quality is detoxification. But what are the multiple ways that we can detoxify? Well, one is to detoxify our home. We don't think that our home, our environment. Can be toxic to us, but it absolutely can. So one is just cleaning your house regularly. Don't let that dirt and dust pile up, because it's full of all sorts of things that we drag in from outside. And I'm sure if you had it tested, you'd find all sorts of crappy stuff in it that none of us want. So make sure your house gets dusted and cleaned and vacuumed on a regular basis. My wife and I are always amazed how much dirt. We sweep up when we start to clean, and、uh, just yesterday, actually this weekend, I would say, is Friday. She cleaned and swept the floor, and she had tons that she was cleaning up. On Saturday, I did the exact same thing as she did, and she was asking me why I did it, and I showed her why because I had tons of dirt here, and she had just cleaned up. Yesterday, so we drag in all sorts of things. So making sure that you clean your house regularly, and one of the ways that we can manage that dirt coming in from outside is that we take off our shoes before we come into the house. So as you're coming in, you either leave it. I'm pointing this way because my front door is that way. But if you leave it at the front door or inside or just outside. Um, that will help to manage how much dirt comes into the house by you and everybody else. Also, getting rid of plastic in the house, plastic that we use for cooking, that can have effect on your endocrine system, has xenoestrogens, and is definitely a no-no. If you want to take that and throw it into your garage and puts all sorts of tools and stuff in it, that's fine. But let's not use it for cooking. And how about clean water? Do you, you drink water that comes out of a water filter? If you don't. You must. I mean, the water that we drink, especially here in the U.S., is contaminated by all sorts of junk, chemicals, medication. None of us want to be drinking any of that, and I don't want it for any of you. So we want to make our body be able to function properly and focus on the areas that we want it to, which is reproduction and not having to clean out all the junk that might be coming from the water that you're consuming. And one other point when it comes to toxins in the house, we don't think of it this way, but any new furniture or new car that you purchase, it has that new car or new furniture smell that we all kind of. Like we're like, oh, this smells so great, or at least many people say that. That is what's called off-gassing. It's the off-gassing of the chemicals that were used to make those products, and those chemicals are now being、um, released into the environment that you breathe in, and now you're exposed to it, and your body's exposed to it. So, if in all cases, the best thing to do in those situations is to, if you have to buy new furniture, is to try to buy used. So that off-gassing has already happened, including with cars. Right? If you have to buy a new car, buy it used. It saves you money, and you don't get that chemical exposure from the off-gassing. But let's say you do need to buy something new for whatever reason. My suggestion is you try to let it air out and breathe as for as long as possible before you are exposed to it in a, an enclosed environment. Okay? Those chemicals can affect your reproductive system and your endocrine system, and we don't want that. Other key points that get brought up or asked often are about lifestyle, specifically exercise. So I have a, a graph that was shared with me about exercise, and what you can see here. Okay, and I'm just going to read through it. Is that it says, and this was a compilation of research. It says that three to four hours per week of vigorous exercise can decrease your fertility, decrease your fertility by 22 to 30 percent, depending on your BMI. That's huge, right? I'm often talking about moderate exercise, but how many of you 
do vigorous exercise, CrossFit and so forth, comment below if you do, because I want to know. But if you do vigorous exercise, then you are potentially decreasing your fertility by 22 to 30%. But if you do moderate exercise, walking regularly, again, for another for the same amount of time, three to four hours per week, you can increase your conception rates by 50%. Look at that difference, right? So regardless of your age, but for sure, again, we want all the things working for us when we're older, so this is a key factor. But also for men, what's interesting is that more sperm are created, the more you exercise, then you have a better chance of having more sperm. I will say there is a caveat to that that um, I find with uh, men who have morphology issues. So if morphology issues are a concern for you, then I might tailor that just a little bit uh, more specifically. And then smoking. Smoking is a no-no. On this other chart right here, we can see that smoking decreases your fertility by upwards of 50%. And how about caffeine? Is caffeine okay? Well, maybe a little bit, but that same graph shows that caffeine can lower your fertility rates by 70%. I'm not talking about coffee. I'm talking about caffeine, which comes and can be found in many forms. But eating a good, healthy diet and exercising moderately can increase your fertility rates by 30 to 50%. So these are all key numbers and key factors that when we're trying to improve our fertility over 40, we want everything working for us. So we wanna address all of these little things and these little things make a big difference. But the other thing that makes a big difference is getting your husband on board or your partner on board doing the same things that you are with all the lifestyle and dietary changes to make huge improvements in your fertility. So make sure they're doing the things with you because just like it can affect your fertility, I just showed you that it can also affect theirs and it takes two to tango. So those are my key points when it comes to improving your fertility over 40 and getting pregnant. And that's what I talk about when I talk about reproductive anti-aging. My bulletproof method to improve your fertility over 35. So go ahead and check that out by clicking the link below. Thanks for watching Fertility TV. I'm going to leave right here some videos that you can watch to help support your fertility and all sorts of good topics that can help you get pregnant hopefully a little bit faster. And until next time, stay fertile. Oh, and remember, subscribe for more videos to help you get pregnant. Just click on that little bell.